Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, and welcome to the free edition of this week's episode of the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast. Before I proceed, I encourage you to become a patron or a subscriber of the show, and you'll get access to the premium versions of each episode, as well as exclusive content that is posted. You can become a patron over at patreon.com slash unauthorized disclosure. Another way to subscribe, support the show is to go to the dissenter.org and at the lowest tier, you can subscribe and get access to all podcast episodes as well as exclusive content. Those who are subscribers and patrons get early access to the show. This was posted several days ago before the Labor Day weekend and shared. Now we're making it available to everyone. So this interview that we have to share is with Jeff Shirky. And Jeff is a historian, a, a journalist, uh, an activist, somebody who has worked on labor issues for a long time. And he is the author of Blue Collar Empire, the untold story of U.S. labor's global anti-communist crusade, highly relevant to the moment as we see what is unfolding with the Democratic presidential primary. As we look at the Democratic National Convention, uh, we look at the politics of labor in the context of a potential presidency uh, by Kamala Harris uh, taking over for Joe Biden, continuing his agenda, uh, but even more so when we look at what is unfolding with the Israeli government's war on Gaza, and we place labor organizing into that context and, and grade and assess the role that labor is playing in resisting the ongoing warfare, uh, the attacks on Palestinians. Um, this book draws a through line. Uh, it, it assesses U.S. foreign policy and the role that the American Federation of Labor and the C Congress of Industrial Organizations have played as partners, willing partners with the CIA, with the National Endowment for Democracy, the State Department, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. And so without going into more detail, our interview does a good enough job of fleshing out the history. This is all, uh, and I, I say this in the interview, he collected all of this history, he synthesized it and put it into one single book so people can understand this narrative of the role that U.S. labor has actually played to help the U.S. government undermine workers' movements around the world in Latin America and on the African continent in particular. So uh, thank you. And here is the interview with Jeff Shirky. Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Jeff Shirky, who is the author of Blue Collar Empire, the untold story of U.S. labor's global anti-communist crusade. And I'm very pleased to be joined by him. So thanks for being on the show, Jeff. Thanks for having me. You know, this is something that people in the labor movement, in the U.S. labor movement, um, sort of, you know, have known about for a long time at different periods of history during the Vietnam War and in, in the 1980s when Reagan was president and, you know, waging these counterinsurgency wars in Central America. Some of this stuff came up within, within the unions and within the AFL-CIO as, you know, discussions and debates, controversies. But for the most part, people in the U.S. labor movement don't really talk about this whole thing. You know, it, it, it sort of gets whispered about every now and then. You read some book about U.S. labor history and it sort of offhandedly mentions, oh yeah, they were working with the CIA and they, you know, were involved in the, uh, the 1954 coup in Guatemala. And then it just kind of moves on to the next thing. And, you know, I, I would read stuff like that and I'd say, wait, what? You know, like, what, what is the story there? So, um, I, uh, yeah, uh, while I was um, doing my PhD in history, that's kind of what I focused on was this, um, this history of union 
the union's relationships with the CIA. And then I discovered it really wasn't just the CIA. It was also the U.S. Agency for International Development, you know, the State Department, and eventually the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy that was created in the 80s. And I found that there were, there's a lot that hasn't been, there's a lot that's still not known about this, understandably, because a lot of it, this relationship um, between the AFL-CIO and uh, the foreign policy apparatus was kind of covert. So it's understandable that a lot of it isn't out there. But I did find that there, there have been various scholars, journalists over the past few decades who have um, found a lot of important stuff about all of this in different countries, in different regions of the world at different periods of time. And it's all kind of disparate. There's a lot of stuff out there. And I thought somebody should kind of put this all together into like a single book um, as well as, you know, add, add to it some new original research from the archives, which was the kind of research I was already doing anyway. Um, and I, so that was kind of like the idea behind the book. And especially because in the last few years, there's been a sort of, you know, revitalization in the labor movement, uh, not necessarily a, a growth because union density is still falling in the United States, but there's a lot more um, interest in unions. Unions are the most popular than they've been in like 50 years, according to polls, and a lot more younger people, more, you know, class conscious um, working class people from uh, you know, in their twenties and thirties, um, you know, who've been screwed over by capitalism. And so they're, you know, and they're in terrible working conditions, um, exploitative working conditions. So they've been mobilizing to unionize previously non-union sectors and non-union companies or else, um, re-energizing existing unions where they are. And there's been an uptick in strikes and uptick in unionization campaigns. And I thought, you know, if, if there is going to be this kind of revitalization or re rebirth or renaissance of the U.S. labor movement. Uh, we need to know about this history, um, not only for just basic, you know, like moral reasons to say this was wrong and there needs to be a definitive break from all of this and a, a different kind of outlook and internationalism in the labor movement moving forward, um, but also to understand that a lot of these uh, foreign intrigues that the AFL-CIO was involved with ultimately were harmful to the U.S. labor. They were harmful to workers everywhere, obviously, in the countries where they were doing these interventions, but also harmful to workers here in the U.S. And that's part of why we got to the place where we are now as a labor movement that's much more, uh, that's much weaker than it was. So understanding this history, I think, is vital for, for many reasons. And uh, yeah, that was the kind of reasoning behind why I wrote, wrote the book. So let's get into this because it is, it's very detailed. There's a lot of extensive um, history that is in there. And some of it uh, I found very eye opening because I hadn't considered this and also hadn't considered some of the like, like the precursors, like the way it builds up because it's not like, it's not immediate that we're talking about the unions are working with the CIA, there is, you know, this part of your book that gets into what's going on even before the CIA is founded. I'd like to have you discuss this thing of forming a, uh, uh, forming an international body of anti-communist free, and I'm doing the air quotes thing around free that you do in your book around, uh, of, of free trade unions. This, this idea that so, so these these labor organizations were concerned that the organizations around the world, the mobilizations of working class people, were too class conscious, uh, conscious, too anti capitalist, and that could be a liability for them, if I understand correctly. So, maybe outline that approach. Yeah, there was this. Um, ubiquitous term that the AFL-CIO and its allies would use, which you mentioned, uh, quote unquote, free trade unionism, which free trade unionism was really uh, kind of a euphemism for just like anti-communist unionism or anti-left unionism, unions, labor movements that were pro-US, that were pro-Western, that were pro-capitalist. 
Um, now, granted, they were still unions in the sense that they wanted to advocate for workers and, you know, but, but it was more about making sure workers had a seat at the table within the established, you know, capitalist U.S. dominated world system. Um, and coming out of World War II, um, in, especially in Europe, a lot of, you know, communist, communist parties were pretty strong because they had been at the center of the anti-fascist resistance in places like Italy and France. And so communist led unions were quite powerful. And during the war there, you know, obviously the U S Britain and the Soviet union were allies in the, the war against the, the fascists. So the labor movements of those countries were, um, were allying with each other with, in the case of the U S the AFL wanted nothing to do with communists, nothing to do with the Soviet Union because they were totally conservative and anti-left. But the CIO, at least initially, was much more tolerant, much more you know, progressive and tolerant of communists. Many CIO unions were led by members of the Communist Party USA. And so after coming out of the war, the CIO, along with the British Trades Union Congress and the Soviet uh, main the main Soviet uh, trade union confederation, uh, as well as other um, like labor federations and other allied countries, formed the World Federation of Trade Unions, which was supposed to kind of continue the wartime alliance between communists and progressive non-communists and you know people uh, and working class people, unions of different countries, to build global labor unity and to try to really prevent a cold war or some kind of you know standoff between the US and Soviet Union from ever happening. And the AFL really immediately got to work trying to destroy that unity and to say, no, no, you have to pick a side. You're either with the Soviets or you're with the US. You're either, you know, pro-freedom or you're pro-totalitarianism, you know, is the sort of terminology they use. And that's where this term free trade unionism came from. And they started chiding, the AFL started chiding the CIO saying, you can't ally yourselves with you know, totalitarian unions, and you can only support the free trade unions. And so the, the AFL really wanted to split the World Federation of Trade Unions as early as 1945, when the war ended and the World Federation of Trade Unions was founded. And at this point, the, the U.S. government was still considering the Soviet Union allies, albeit, you know, untrustworthy allies, or there was a lot of tension, obviously, already there. But nevertheless, the Cold War hadn't really started yet for Washington, but it did. It had started immediately for the AFL. And this is something I try to, you know, a point I try to make in the book that a lot of these union officials were, you know, even more anti-communist than a lot of the, their counterparts in the government. And they were, you know, already trying to call for the uh, call, call for a Cold War and already you know, trying to do the types of things that would later be funded by the CIA once it was created in 1947, 48. Um, so <clears throat> eventually, at the, and you mentioned the Marshall Plan, which was kind of the issue that did serve to drive a wedge between communists and non-communists in Western Europe, because on the one hand, the, West, the Marshall Plan was, you know, ostensibly this humanitarian effort to rebuild Western Europe after it was destroyed by the war. And that would be good for a lot of working class people in places like France and Italy and Britain and West and West Germany. Um, but on the other hand, the Marshall Plan was also, you know, a, a project to revitalize uh, an international capitalist order where the U.S. would be um, sort of maintaining the system and trying to prevent crises like the, you know, like what had happened with the Great Depression or the two world wars and creating, you know, the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. Um, and so the Marshall Plan was also trying to like pull these countries of Western Europe that had strong communist movements, pull them away from communism, pull them away from the Soviet Union and towards the U.S. and integrate their economies into this new international capitalist system. So, um, yeah, the main major unions of Western Europe were leaning pro Marshall plan while the Soviet Union obviously was the anti Marshall plan because they saw it as a, a way to, to undermine um, the appeal of communism in Europe. And this was the AFL kind of used this to continue pressuring mm -hmm. 
the unions that have joined the World Federation of Trade Unions to say you should pull out of this. You should only be involved in, you know, supporting the so-called free trade unions. And finally, that's what happened in the CIO, the British Trade Union Congress um, and others abandoned the WFTU and together with the AFL, they formed in 1949, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions to be like a rival to the World Federation of Trade Unions. So basically, in a more, you know, just simple sense, they, they divided the international labor movement along these Cold War battle lines that, um, that they, that the AFL in particular was, was pushing for this right from the beginning, even before there was a Marshall Plan, even before there was a CIA, even before the Cold War had really begun, the AFL was already trying to do this um, because of how vehemently anti-communist they were. If I'm reading correctly, it doesn't seem like it takes a whole lot to convince or persuade the leadership of the AFL or even the CIO to be partners in these endeavors globally, uh, especially when uh, there's a CIA official that wants to collaborate or someone in the State Department. Well, you, you describe how there's um, attaches that are, um, you have labor attaches that are basically around the world. At, I believe they'd be positioned at embassies so that they could uh, perform their functions and uh, that, that they come from, you know, like these elite upper, they're, they're upper class individuals, primarily not what we consider to be working class rank and file people. And so how does the free trade union committee fit into this? Because you spend some time when, uh, the CIA comes on the scene outlining how uh, the Free Trade Union Committee is working with the CIA. Yeah, the Free Trade Union Committee was this um, body that the AFL founded in 1944 to, to go out initially just to Europe to, um, to do like what I was just talking about, to try to split labor movements along Cold War battle lines. And... Um, Initially, the Free Trade Union Committee, it was just funded by the AFL itself and its affiliated unions. It was sort of didn't have a very big budget, but um, it was successful in, in dividing the French labor movement in particular in uh, like 1947, again, because of with using the Marshall Plan as kind of a, a justification to, to um, get communist and non-communist union members fighting with each other. And once the CIA was created and went into operation, they wanted, they really recognized that um, labor movements abroad were going to be vital to what, you know, what the future, what the sort of geopolitical future would look like because labor movements in Europe and in Latin America and Asia were very powerful and had a lot of influence on the political direction of uh, different countries. And obviously if labor movements were more class conscious, more militant, more anti-capitalist, more um, sympathetic to communism in the Soviet Union, that would be bad for, for Washington and for, for corporate America and for Wall Street. Um, so the CIA wanted to be able to influence labor movements abroad, but they knew that if it was just like a CIA agent going up to a union leader in Italy or in Brazil or uh, Indonesia or wherever, it, they wouldn't make a lot of headway, you know, say I'm a CIA agent, I want to work with your union. But if it was an American union official going to these labor movements abroad saying, hey, I'm, an, I'm a fellow union member, and I'm just here trying to, you know, work with you in solidarity, so called, um, then that might open up doors that the CIA couldn't open on its own. And the CIA saw what the AFL's Free Trade Union Committee had already been doing in France and other places in Western Europe. And they said, well, you guys are really know what you're doing. You're really good at this. Why don't we give you a lot of money um, to continue doing this and to expand into other parts of the world, doing the same kind of thing of splitting labor movements, of um, propping up more conservative pro-capitalist union factions and having them break from the larger you know, union federations in different countries uh, and that kind of thing. So. There was this, in 1949, the beginning of a covert relationship between the CIA 
and the AFL's Free Trade Union Committee. And um, that more or less continued in different iterations. You know, the Free Trade Union Committee was eventually shut down, but then after the AFL and CIO merged, uh, new uh, organizations, new institutes were founded, like in the American Institute for Free Labor Development was founded in the early 60s to uh, influence unions in Latin America. There was similar institutes created for Africa and Asia um, that also received, you know, they partnered and coordinated with the CIA, but they were really getting most of their money from the U.S. Agency for International Development and later from the uh, National Endowment for Democracy as well. So there, there wound up being this whole like long-term um, relationship where the AFL and later AFL-CIO was getting money from these government agencies, initially the CIA, but then others as well, to carry out these this um, this foreign policy of, again, trying to divide labor movements along these Cold War ideological battle lines. And often, you know, talk I talk about in the book, often um, getting the more conservative union factions to um, sometimes even like go on strikes or general strikes to try to undermine left-wing governments in places like Guyana and Brazil and Chile. Um, so, um, yeah, and I would also just mention that they, just to be clear about how I say this AFL was so vehemently anti-communist right from the beginning, but the CIO initially was more tolerant uh, of the left but that started to shift for the CIO as the Cold War came into focus in the late 40s, and especially after Congress, congressional Republicans passed the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, which really restricted a lot of what unions could do, a lot of what made unions successful in the 30s uh, and early 40s, like sit-down strikes and uh, other types of militant tactics, as well as the Taft-Hartley Act allowed states to begin passing right to work laws, which is another you know, thing that you have, to, you have to put in air quotes, right to work, which is just an anti-union policy to try to defund and bankrupt unions in the private sector. And the Taft-Hartley Act, importantly for this story, required that union officials sign affidavits swearing that they were not members of the Communist Party. And you know, the problem was a lot of union officials in the CIO were members of the Communist Party, or even if they weren't, they might be sympathetic um, to the Communist Party or have comrades who were communists, and they would say, I don't want to sign this. I don't want to be part of this. Um, and that kind of forced CIO leadership to take, a, to take a position, basically. they Just like how the AFL was forcing unions abroad to sort of take a side, you know, are you with the freedom lovers or are you with the evil totalitarians? The CIO kind of did the same thing, and they they calculate there's some of their key leaders like Walter Ruther, president of the United Auto Workers, sort of made this calculation that said, well, we're better off just, you know, dumping the communists, purging them, getting rid of them and siding with the AFL and basically going along with this Cold War anti-communist crusade. So that's what happened in the late 40s with the CIO. And that's partly why within a few years after that, the CIO merged with the AFL and it became the AFL-CIO with a basically single policy of supporting the Cold War. Yeah, you do a good job of, of, of showing that this effort to make sure there are no communists in the ranks does affect the membership overall of, of the union and, you know, and even the strength of the union to organize. Uh, and then in the early 1950s, I was, I was drawn to, to, this part of the book where you get into what's happening with Juan Perón's Argentina and Peronissimo. And then in my head, I was, uh, I was, I was juxtapo juxtaposing it with what you document and, uh, and, and recount with Guatemala because it's just so much more ugly and, and brutal um, what's unfolding with the CIA's coup in Guatemala. And so maybe um, with those two countries in mind, although you don't really have to stay in those two countries, you could go other places if, if necessary. W would you talk a bit about how like the, 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 the strategy or the, the agreed upon approach 
that the AFL you know goes along with the CIA or the, or the U.S. government, like how this backfires on them. Because in particular, you see that with Guatemala, that it's it, with the what happens there that you know now they're worse off than before when they aligned with uh, the United States government. Yeah, um, I mean it's a sim. It's kind of you know a, I guess in some ways a well known story with um, the CIA and with these sort of imperial intrusions during the Cold War period and beyond, where um, the U.S. government you know stages some kind of coup or uh, has a you know goes goes to war, sends in the troops, does something like that. You know, military occupation, and they're thinking this is going to bring, or they're not. Maybe they're not really thinking this, but they're saying they're, this is going to bring freedom and democracy and prosperity to this country, and we're saving, you know, we're saving the day. We're the good guys, and then of course, things just get so much worse for the people in that country, for the economy of that country, um, and uh, for social stability in that country, whatever the country is. You know, whether it's Guatemala or Iran or Brazil or Chile uh, or Iraq. Um, and so it's a similar kind of dynamic playing out with these AFL CIO officials talking about they're going to bring free trade unionism. They're going to, you know, save very, these various countries from these awful totalitarians. And then what happens is that the trade unions in those countries, well, what happens after, after the coup or the, the war, the intervention, whatever the you know, particular story is, um, once the U.S., once the CIA does whatever it is they want to do, to destabilize that country and put in a more pro-U.S. anti-communist government, that government proceeds to become a you know horrible military dictatorship, but particularly the dictatorship that is uh, crushing the unions in those countries. So while the AFL-CIO said in Guatemala in 1954 and Brazil in 64, Chile in 73, they said you know we're we're helping to overthrow these. Um, uh, communist or communist friendly governments, and it's going to bring freedom and prosperity for the workers and the unions of those countries. What ends up happening is the unions in those countries face severe restrictions and union members are imprisoned, tortured, murdered, uh, systematically for many, many years. And, um, you know, the AFL-CAO basically just kind of shrugs and says, whoops, and then does it again, you know, a few years later, just like the just like the U.S. government. So it's, you know, you have to question, is it really, do they not know what they're doing? Or is it more just about defeating the left at any cost and using this rhetoric of freedom and democracy or free trade unionism just as a justification or as a, you know, excuse? A good example, I guess I could talk about more specifically would be uh, Brazil in 1964. I mentioned the American Institute for Free Labor Development or AFIELD. There's so many like acronyms. I think you probably notice in the book. There's so many of these uh, abbreviations and acronyms of all these different institutes and committees and foundations that, you know, because this is all how U.S. foreign policy operates, especially in the Cold War period, with all these subsidiaries of different, you know, uh, of the CIA and subsidiaries of the AFL-CIO itself, and just multiple layers to try to really confuse people and the general public from knowing what's really happening. Um, from, you know, from knowing how our tax dollars are being spent or how union dues are being spent. So, but anyway, um, you know, in the, in the early Cold War period, the AFL had this thing that I talked about, the Free Trade Union Committee, but later going into the 60s and 70s um, and 80s, the, there was the American Institute for Free Labor Development or AFIELD, which was specifically focused on Latin America. It was founded after the Cuban Revolution when People in Washington and the leaders of the AFL-CIO became very concerned about communism spreading in Latin America. And um, in, in Brazil, um, well, what, sorry, I should say what AFIELD, American Institute for Free Labor Development, what it actually did for the most part was these educational uh, programs, these training programs where they would bring union leaders from different Latin American countries to the United States, to Washington, and do this intensive training program where you know, ostensibly it was like, you know, classes about collective bargaining and union administration and labor history and stuff like that. But also it was about training them how to fight 
radicals within their own unions, how to go back home to their home, go back to their home countries after these trainings with funding from a field, which the money was originating from USAID um, to um, fight back against any kind of left wing um, or anti-imperialist uh, movements within, within their own unions. And um, in the case of Brazil in 1963, which was a year before the coup, Afield hosted a, a special like all Brazilian class of like 33 union leaders from Brazil who received this, this training um, of how to go back to their home countries, fight against the left in the, within the ranks of their own unions. And they went back to Brazil with funding from, from Afield. And over the course of the next year, they were, um, you know, covertly working with the um, right wing factions within Brazil, particularly within the military, which itself was working with the CIA and uh, U.S. Embassy in Brazil um, to stage the coup against Goulart, who was the constitutional, you know, democratic president of Brazil. The problem that Washington and the AFL-CIO had with Goulart was that he was very progressive, pro-left. He was seen as being too sympathetic to the communists, you know, that they saw him as a communist puppet, and they were worried that he would lead Brazil to becoming another, another Cuba. So the coup, military coup in Brazil happened uh, April 1st, 1964. The CIA was backing it. The U.S. Embassy was backing it. It was described in the U.S. as, you know, this revolution to save Brazil from totalitarianism, blah, blah, blah. The same story, you know, that played out in other countries. Um, but at, right after the coup, uh, these A-field graduates who had done this training with, you know, in, in Washington, they they were appointed by the new by the coup regime to serve as sort of trustees, or they called them interveners, to take over some of the Brazilian unions that had strong left wing factions and to purge them of all communists or leftists or or Goular sympathizers, and they were put back on the payroll of of A-field, you know, given extra money to basically conduct these anti-left purges in service of the coup regime. Um, and a, a, a top A-field official, uh, Bill Doherty, gave a radio interview a few months after the coup where he was saying, oh yeah, this coup didn't just happen. You know, it was planned well in advance. And some of our own graduates of our training program were involved in the clandestine activities that, you know, that helped overthrow the, the, the regime. And so kind of bragging openly that they were uh, involved in this. And then of course we know, I think most people know what happened in Brazil. They didn't get more freedom and trade union freedom, but instead um, the coup regime, you know, instituted this um, uh, uh, very draconian dictatorship. Hundreds of thousands of union members were imprisoned or tortured, killed again, just like what happened in Guatemala and Chile later and other countries as well. Um, but the, the A-Field, which had been so, the AFL-CIO and its subsidiary A-Field had been so determined to drive out Goulart when he was in power, you know, to say, well, this is totalitarianism. We got to do everything we can to overthrow him. But once the military dictatorship took over in Brazil, they were now sort of saying, well, you know, this is not ideal having this dictatorship. And, you know, we recognize it's not good, but you know, we'll, we'll stay there. We'll, we'll kind of get things ready for the day when they relax some of their restrictions on union activity. Um, so a much more like sort of sort of flexible attitude in the face of this right-wing military dictatorship than in the face of a democratic, but left-wing uh, government. Well, more broadly, there's this rise of the third world that you um, dig into. And um, I don't know. I, I mean, Sometimes it's more accurate these days to say global south because there is this, this you know, you see a different treatment in you know, the Western Europe and even parts of Asia being treated much differently than all those countries in the global south. But what uh, be, it, it's laid out in your book that there's a different attitude about the African continent because there's still European white colonizers that are there. But as there are um, anti-colonial uprisings throughout the continent, particularly in the late 50s, 60s, uh, there's a shift 
And so how does the, uh, how do, just if you could spend a little bit of time, how does the labor in the United States choose to approach um, union organizing or uh, the importance of workers movements in Africa without, uh, while still being a willing partner with the CIA and these other organizations in the US? Yeah, so Africa was, uh, like you say, in the early Cold War period, still uh, under you know European colonial control. But by the sort of late 50s, early 60s, and continuing, continuing throughout the 60s, um, the anti-colonial movements. And as that happened, you know, the, the AFL-CIO, similar to the U.S. government, was generally supportive of the anti-colonial movements, not because they were genuinely like, you know, supporting independence of, uh, of long oppressed peoples in Africa, but because they saw it in, in a cold war, uh, cold, through a cold war lens where they kind of recognized that um, independence of African colonies was inevitable after World War II had really severely weakened the old European colonial powers. Um, and they knew that the Soviet Union um, and then the People's Republic of China as well was, you know, really encouraging anti-colonial movements in Africa and, and Asia as well. Um, and there were a lot of, you know, left-wing uh, and communist parties within Africa that were participating in these independence movements. The FLCIO, just like the U.S. government, thought we, you know, if, if these countries are going to be independent, we want to make sure they stay on our side, that they stay in the Western camp and that they don't they aren't influenced by uh, the Soviet Union or China. So they basically said, we support the anti-colonial movements because they knew that if they were, um, if they were like supporting the European powers that would just push Africa directly into the, into the arms of the Soviets. So that was sort of their reasoning. It was sort of like, we wanna just make sure that we stay in, on the good side of these African independence movements and, and convince them that they want to be um, they want to be pro U.S. and pro West and not align themselves with the communist world. Um, so the AFL-CIO had a especially in the '60s, its main um, sort of ambassador to Africa was this woman, Maida Springer, who's an African American woman. Um, who had been a garment worker in New York and sort of rose through the union ranks. And she was, she's an interesting figure in the book because while she was an anti-communist and she was sort of, um, sort of tied to some of these same CIO, I'm sorry, CIA uh, officials within the labor movement, you know, there isn't a lot of evidence that she was directly tied to the CIA. It was just sort of indirectly through some of these different people like uh, Jay Lovestone, who's a major figure in the book and, Irving Brown, but she was more like genuinely uh, supportive of independent African independence for its own sake. And she was a pan-Africanist and she wanted, you know, like the idea of kind of bringing the black uh, or civil rights movement in the U S um, into an alliance with the anti-colonial movements in Africa. And so she, she traveled all around sub-Saharan Africa in the fifties and sixties um, supporting these like new countries as they came into, as they became independent or new states, I should say. Um, and a lot of the governments of these countries, like in, in Ghana or Guinea or Kenya, um, a lot of the government leaders, independence leaders were also leaders in the, those countries, labor movements, you know, was, unions had played a big role in the anti-colonial struggle of, you know, going on strike and, uh, making these demands to, to win their independence. And she was uh, well liked by a lot of these sort of young political leaders who were also labor leaders, um, people like Tom Maboya in Kenya. Um, and she worked really hard to try to make sure that they would be, uh, to try to meet their actual immediate needs of vocational training and helping bring uh, investments to build up their economies. But at the same time, the European Union leaders uh, who were also who were tied to colonialism in a lot of ways. They were kind of still being sort of racist and paternalistic towards um, African unions. 
and wanting to kind of maintain their control over them. So she was often in conflict with these, Maida Springer was often in conflict with these uh, European union leaders. And at the same time, the, the Maida Springer's bosses within the AFL-CIO were kind of had their own kind of agenda, like I said, which was they wanted to support these African movements, but wanted to make sure it was more grounded in anti-communism for them than in pan-Africanism. So there wound up being kind of this movement in the 60s among, led by uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the president of, of Ghana, to say, you know, we don't want to be part of, um, and this goes along with the, the, this idea of the third world, which in the, at that time, the third world, you know, as the historian Vijay Prashad says, it was not so much a place, but a, a, um, a political movement of uh countries of Africa and Asia and Latin America that for so long had been um, colonized or, you know, suffering from imperialism, trying to assert their independence from both the first world, the capitalist world and the second world, the communist world, and to be, uh, you know, to be able to say we're, we're neutral in this Cold War conflict. We, we only want to, um, you know, advance our own countries and our own peoples, and we want to have dignity and not be pawns in this Cold War game. And so Nkrumah kind of was saying that the labor movements of Africa should be independent. They shouldn't be part of uh, the Western aligned International Confederation of Free Trade Unions. Um, and meanwhile, the AFL-CIO was saying, no, we want you to be aligned with us. And uh, in, in any case, a, a sort of similar thing happened as in Europe and Latin America, which was that the labor movements of Africa became much more divided uh, because of these ideological Cold War uh, struggles. Um, but it, it is a somewhat unique case because of the role of Maida Springer, who was like a genuine Pan-Africanist uh, and was um, trying to support these movements in Africa. Um, although, again, she was an anti-communist. She was part of this general picture, but just sort of uh, a little different from, from some of her uh, colleagues in the AFL-CIO. Admit I wasn't familiar with this episode, and it's possible that you'll tell me that it's quite well known. Uh, but I thought, as an illustration of uh, the dynamic that was being created and fostered through this AFL CIA partnership, that uh, I would like to have you speak a bit about the hard hat riot that took place during the Vietnam War. And the way that perhaps constrained uh, or impacted union organizing that was uh, pro-international, you know, would, would be willing to cross country divides and uh, promote international solidarity. Uh, so during the Vietnam War, uh, like I was saying earlier, the top leadership of the AFL-CIO was like totally supportive of the war even as the general population was moving more and more against it. And a lot of rank and file union members and working class people were protest, begin, you know, increasingly protesting the war as it dragged on and more and more people were killed. Um, and in 1970, um, in May of 1970, this was right after Nixon announced the inv US invasion of Cambodia. And he also revealed that the US had already been bombing Cambodia for a year without, you know, previously telling the public or telling Congress about that, there was this new wave of uh, anti-war protests. I mean, the anti-war movement had been happening all along, but it had kind of quieted down after 1968. And then in uh, spring of, 60, of 70, it kind of exploded again after this announcement about invading Cambodia. And that this is the same week that the Kent State massacre happened. Um, and short, shortly after that, I think it was May 8th, 1970, in lower Manhattan, the, a group of college students and high school students were having this like relatively small, quiet anti-war protest on Wall Street, when then su suddenly hundreds of construction workers, building trades from the building trades unions, um, some of them who were actually constructing the World Trade Center towers nearby, they came swooping in and as like counter protesters or really like rioters to come and attack uh, this student anti-war protest and started like beating the crap out of these students and chasing them down the streets of uh, lower Manhattan while the police, of course, just kind of stood by and looked the other way. And uh, this got a lot of media attention and it became called the hard hat riot. Uh, 
um, because the, obviously the construction workers were wearing their hard hats. Um, and they were, you know, waving the American flag. And it was kind of the beginning of this shift where for, since the New Deal, the 1930s, the working class and the unions had been squarely on the side of this kind of New Deal liberalism, it's more to, sort of more kind of social democratic kind of policies of uh, supporting the Democratic Party, um, the, the more kind of FDR or LBJ kind of Democratic Party that was actually trying to you know, implement some social legislation um, and shifting away from that and becoming more associated with, uh, especially blue collar workers and building trades workers, becoming more associated with conservatism and Republicans and this sort of um, sort of uh, 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 patriotism that's kind of, uh, what do I want to say, kind of like a, a showing off or empty kind of just, uh, you know, waving the flag, chanting USA, USA, that kind of thing, love it or leave it, um, which was, you know, a big response to the anti-war movement. And that's what was sort of motivating these construction workers, uh, the sense that those anti-war um protesters these you know there's these privileged college kids who don't know how good they have it and you know me i have to work for a living and, and plus they were a lot of these guys were from the generation of world that had fought in world war ii and had you know really developed and, you know and they had come of age during the new deal when the u.s government was actually like helping the working class so they felt any kind of disloyalty to the government or to the flag was out of line and and in any case the um, AFL-CIO's international affairs director at the time, this guy I mentioned briefly before, Jay Lovestone, who was, a, you know, a CIA agent, really, um, for most of his career. He saw an opportunity after that hard hat riot happened where he got the Nixon administration in touch with the leaders of the building trades unions in New York. And they did this kind of press conference uh, not long later where the leader of the uh, New York City Building Trades Unions, this guy named P Peter Brennan, like pinned a, lapel, a flag pin on Richard Nixon's lapel. And, you know, this is why, when politicians started wearing these big American flag pins, you know, and just, to remind people like, yeah, this is the country, <laughs> this, this is the country I live in. Um, uh, <laughs> And uh, Brennan then was made Nixon's uh, Secretary of Labor. So Brennan, again, was the leader of the building trades unions who had kind of orchestrated this hard hat riot. And he was rewarded for it. And in Nixon's reelection in 1972, for the first time, a lot more working class blue collar union members started voting for Republicans. Um, but the, and this, the hard hat riot is fairly well remembered, or at least even if people don't know about the actual event, the outcome of it is well known even today of this idea that we hear all the time about like Trump and Trump supporters as like, you know, blue mm. collar or working class, working Joes, you know, whatever, even though a lot of that is kind of a stereotype, um, but there is some truth to it. And it kind of originated with this moment uh, in 1970 with this uh, hard hat riot. And the downside of that though, for the labor movement, I mean, it, it ignores the fact that there were a lot of, union people who were adamantly against the war, especially um, people of color, people in less privileged jobs in the service sector, you know, black Latina women uh, in the healthcare industry were very much opposed to the war. And that all gets kind of ignored even today when people talk about Trump and his supposedly, you know, working class appeal. Um, it completely ignores that there's like the vast majority of the working class has a much different position than this you know, unrepresentative um, idea of the, you know, white reactionary hard hats going out and beating up the anti-war protesters. Um, so, but it served to going into the 70s and beyond, a lot of the more left-wing social movements that started to emerge saw the labor movement as an enemy, as, a, as opposed to an ally. And it kind of kept that also served to further weaken the labor movement and served to weaken generally progressive forces in the U.S. overall, where, um, you know, you had the environmentalist movement and the feminist movement and LGBTQ movement, among many others, for a long time kind of estranged from the labor movement. There has been work over the last, you know, 20 years or so to try to fix that and to bring the labor movement more in line with the rest of you know, other social movements and to recognize that the labor movement in many ways is kind of central to all of them. 
because people spend most of their lives at work and a lot of these you know issues of of racism and sexism and other forms of discrimination and oppression play out through 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 the economy and through work and so unions really are central to this but it really did the hard hat riot and the the press's reaction to it um, and the sort of narrative that it created has really served to uh, weaken the labor movement in the long term. And um, yeah, I mean, abroad for, for unions in other countries, a lot of them, especially in Latin America, they know that, you know, they, when you mention the AFL-CIO to them, they'll immediately say, don't you mean the AFL-CIA? Like they know this history that's in this book much better than we in the U.S. do because they were on the receiving end of so much of this. And that, that, I think, has also served to kind of undermine international solidarity for many years, which is another reason why it's so important for people in the U.S. labor movement to know about this history. Um, because if we want to build international solidarity with workers in other countries, we need to recognize how they see us, um, you know, just in the same way that how they see the United States in general, but specifically how they see our labor movement um, because of the way it uh, for so long was has partnered with the U.S. government. Yeah, uh, you know, there's there's a number of shows that I've done or interviews that I've done on uh, the left wing rising and a, assuming power and winning power in Latin America. And I imagine and I, I know that there's a lot of those on the left who look at U.S. labor and frustration and wonder why there's not more solidarity you know, how, why is there more, why isn't there more solidarity with Lula as he, you know, is um, running Brazil or, and then also, you know, why isn't there more of a backlash and opposition standing up for working people if someone like uh, Bolsonaro is running Brazil as well. So that's the other side of the coin. So thank you for writing this book and thanks for coming on to have this interview I'm going to give you a chance to plug your uh, book or tell people where they can get it. But I do want to just quickly insert one little nugget and say that people should look for the notorious figure of Frank Wisner from the CIA to uh, make an appearance in the book. If you don't know who he is, uh, those who are listening to the show or watching the show, you can go read and learn a little bit about Frank Wisner, but he's... Um, someone who pops up whenever there's uh, mayhem and chaos being stirred by the CIA in the 1960s, 70s too. So uh, where uh, should people go if they want to buy your book? Yeah, so uh, again, the book is Blue Collar Empire and uh, it's basically anywhere, any online bookseller, um, you know, you can go to the Verso website and find it there. It's published by Verso. Um, or any of the others, um, wherever you wherever you buy your books online, um, that's where you can find it. And it'll be out on September 24th, but you Excellent. can pre-order it now. Well, thank you. And again, I'll just you know, I'll, I'll wave it in front of the camera here and say this is what it looks like. If anybody would be confused, and uh, thank you, thank you so much for talking, Jeff. Thank you, I appreciate it.